Hi, it's Kate Swaffer here again, talking today to you from behind the scenes of writing my book, What the Hell Happened to My Brain? Living Beyond Dementia. My publishers had asked me a few questions about living beyond dementia and also about writing this book and about the process of studying post-diagnosis. As you probably already know, I'm from Adelaide in Australia and was diagnosed with younger onset dementia at the ripe old age of 49 as a married working mum with teenage sons. For the first few weeks following the diagnosis of dementia, I couldn't stop crying and I started running to take away the tears. The thought of what lay ahead for me and what might be ahead for my husband and sons was almost unthinkable. Ironically, I'd worked in the first dedicated dementia unit in Adelaide in the 70s and therefore I had a real idea of what end stage dementia will be like. On top of what lay ahead, the system simply supported me to give up my pre-diagnosis life and to prepare to die via aged care. So I continued trying to work and to study and bring up our kids with my husband and in between I wept. At university I was studying poetry and wrote a poem about how I was feeling back then. It's called Slipping Away. Life slipping away, terrified one day soon I won't know my children. Life slipping away, mortified one day soon I won't know my husband. Life slipping away, disbelief one day soon I won't know my family. Life slipping away, angry, one day soon I won't know my friends. Life slipping away, humiliated, one day soon I won't know how to drive. Life slipping away, despairing, one day soon I won't know who I am. I was fearful of what lay ahead and of what I was losing, that sense of losing who I was and who I would become. The dreadful images used in the media to this day continue and there is so little support that even remotely suggests you might be able to live with dementia, not only die from it. I was prescribed disengagement and for some time I accepted this unhelpful prescription. What I was told to do was give up work, give up study, get my end of life affairs in order and along the way get acquainted with aged care. Remember, I was only 49, not 90. There was little support, no age appropriate services, and the support that was there still was little more than the pathway of aged care, desolation and death. And dementia is the only disease or condition I know of where people are told to go home and give up, not to fight for our lives. Thank goodness I ultimately was shown and accepted there was and is another way to live with and to live beyond dementia. This diagnosis had great potential to affect the quality of my life negatively and in ways that were unexpected, but through ultimately seeing the symptoms of dementia as disabilities, needing strategies and support, I've maintained a good quality of life. That is in spite of the things that I'd heard might happen and did not expect to happen, such as many of our family and friends no longer spending time with us. Dementia is an unknown to many people still, and the myth that we're going to be end stage in the disease, I think, scares people away. It stigmatises us and ensures we are discriminated against. Some of the most frustrating things about living with dementia are simple things like the loss of function, not easily being able to cook meals, and things like not knowing where I am, getting lost in familiar places. The most important factor I suspect in ensuring my quality of life has not been too negatively affected is the refusal to accept that I should give up and instead learning to function with disability support so that I could continue living my own life and a life that's meaningful to me. There are many positive things about dementia as well, including perhaps a better sense of humour I've been told and a creativity that was not showing itself before dementia. Other changes, including changes in taste and even dress sense, can be positive. We've also made many new and wonderful friendships. And the depth of the love and friendship with those old friends and family still in our life 
and with my husband and sons is far deeper and more profound and beautiful than before. Dementia has ensured I've accepted life as finite and even though we are all born with a death sentence, it's not until serious illness knocks at your door that you take this seriously. With dementia support and strategies from the University of South Australia, then Wollongong, I managed to complete two bachelor degrees and a master's degree after the diagnosis of dementia. The difference in how universities support people with disabilities, including disabilities from dementia, is completely different to how the health sector and service providers tell us to manage living with dementia. The disability support team at university set me up with mentors, a buddy on campus to help with wayfinding when I needed it, note takers, as it, this was before lectures were available as podcasts, extensions for library loans and exams and assignments, IT software that supports dyslexia and other things like voice to text. In fact, for the final undergrad Bachelor of Psychology exam, my disability advisor went above and beyond the call of duty and arranged to be the exam moderator and to allow me to sit the exam in my own home at 6am to take away the stress of trying to focus in crowds and she also knew that mornings my brain works best. I soon started to wonder why all people with dementia don't get this type of disability support. The stresses of studying and dealing with the additional obstacles caused by dementia did require strength and motivation, but predominantly it was due to a proactive, rehabilitative, social disability pathway of support that was provided that I've since found is the best way forward for people with dementia. It showed me there could be life beyond dementia, but a serious dose of motivation and grit and determination is also needed, as well as many disability supports and strategies that helped me to continue to function and study albeit differently than before, but in the same way a young student with dyslexia requires support or a person who can no longer walk needs a wheelchair. Universities are well equipped to support people with disabilities and it made me wonder why the healthcare sector does not offer the same support to people with, disability, with dementia. Hence the pathway of I've been on of discovery and publishing to see if I could change the pathway of care from a medical model to one that's a disability and social pathway of support. That is, after all, a basic human right. Staying focused at uni was all up to me and that definitely required motivation and determination. As many days, even now, it would be easier to hide under the covers and cry. Living beyond, beyond dementia is nothing like a birthday party, but the alternative is hideous. I started writing as a way of healing after reading excerpts from Richard Taylor. They reminded me that I used to suggest writing for healing to people who were bereaved when I was volunteering in that sector many years ago. So I started writing and then one day started up a public blog, quite naively not even realising others could or would read it. Writing became my tool to stay inspired and to share my thoughts, to remind me of who I really am. And on the days I can't remember what I've done or said or where I've been, then I can read my own blogs to find out what I've been up to. It's helped me retain the essence of who I am, my sense of self, as well as helping me stay really connected to the world. As my blog community of fa family and friends keep the doors of communication open, even when I'm holed up alone at home. Now that my book, What the Hell Happened to My Brain, Living Beyond Dementia is out, it feels a bit odd, as, as although I wanted to write a book for almost forever, I didn't ever think I would. And then when Mr Dementia turned up, it was certainly the last thing from my mind until I started blogging. Setting myself a goal to blog daily for a year in 2011, and then for another year, set me up with the discipline and habit of writing, making it easier to keep going when approached about publishing this book. The writing process was helped with a form of mind mapping to help me stay on task, but also to see where it was going to go and to explore ideas. I chose topics in the book that I felt needed to be heard, many of which I had already written about, but that I felt needed elaborating on and really need to be heard. Many of the topics may be uncomfortable for some, 
but not once is my book meant to be critical of others' effort or of a care partner's devotion, love and role, but rather to tell another side to the same story. I have felt for too long that people without dementia have been telling our stories, and the question of whose story it is to tell had been dangling in front of me for a while. It's my story, and another person with dementia will have his or her own story, but I feel we are the ones who should be telling them. Some of the struggles and the barriers my family and I deal with in everyday life are the simple things, like me forgetting how to cook and needing support, or that I can't drive, so I need assistance with transport often. They sometimes struggle with my need to remain as independent as possible, as that causes them to worry more. We've struggled with the loss of old friends, and the hidden impact of this is the loss of friends, mentors, and social support for our children. We also struggled emotionally with those who openly disbelieve I have dementia. It's a common experience, and these days I simply suggest they go and insult my neurologist. It seems if you do well with dementia, you're either a liar or your doctor is wrong, but if you do well with cancer, everyone applauds you and wants to know what you've done. That really needs to change, as almost no one is at end stage of dementia when they're diagnosed. I think it is unfair for me to un advise other families on what is best for them, but I do feel the crippling negative effects of prescribed disengagement impacts us all, and so I'd perhaps suggest thinking about seeing and manage the symptoms of dementia as disabilities needing support to enable independence for as long and to increase at least a sense of control, well-being and hope for a future after the diagnosis. Get as much information as you possibly can about the type of dementia you have and its unique symptoms and then work on strategies to keep living. I've written another book with lots of specific information about strategies and for dementia as well as a big focus on well-being and staying positive. But the changes I most hope to see in my lifetime is the support and treatment of people with dementia will include full inclusion. The catchphrase, nothing about us without us, is still a dream and it's not a reality. I want to see a more ethical pathway of support that includes rehabilitation and includes access to the United Nations Conventions of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities which we are recognised under, but which no one has ever bothered to ensure people with dementia have access to. The prescribed disengagement must stop, as this disempowers and disables people with dementia, and it takes away our control, giving it all to others. It's unhelpful, unhealthy, and it ensures dependence. The only advice or a real encouragement I'd suggest for people recently diagnosed with dementia <clears throat> is that you demand better support to live with dementia and strategies for the disabilities it will force onto you in the same way you would if you'd had a stroke or a brain injury from a car accident. Fight for your life in the very same you would if you were told you had cancer. Dementia is a terminal illness and I, as I've said many times, it is nothing like a birthday party on many days and it may not be so great towards the end especially for those who love and are supporting us. But along the way, dementia's given me a passion and a drive to help create change, to improve the lives of people with dementia and their families, that sustains me and helps me get out of bed every single day. Thankfully, I've learned to live beyond dementia for now and alongside of it, in spite of the increasing changes and deterioration of functioning. And as I said in a recent introduction to this book, Thank you for being interested in my book and being interested in improving the lives of people with dementia and their families and friends. If you're here listening again, you must be really interested and I feel deeply honoured and grateful and thankful for your presence. Thank you.